On this video, I've got an update on the now famously controversial autism research study, Spectrum 10K. Plus, I'll share some of the most important bits from my chat with Hunter Hansen, discussing our key concerns on the research study. So let's go. Welcome, my friend. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. I'm Orion Kelly, that autistic guy, and I'm all about helping you raise your level of understanding, acceptance, and appreciation of the autistic community. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, well, I'd be delighted if you would consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. And the absolute best part of doing that is you will join the most amazing YouTube community. An update on Spectrum 10K. Now, for those wondering, what are you talking about? So Spectrum 10K is a research study that was introduced to the public a couple of years back, I believe in 2021. So here we are in 2023. Obvious question is, sorry, why are we still talking about it? Wouldn't it be finished by now? Well, here's the thing. Upon its release, Spectrum 10K received international pushback. The people behind the research study, Spectrum 10K, officially placed the study on pause. But why? What could be so bad about a university research study on autism? Okay, well, let's go back to the start just briefly from its own website. Spectrum 10K aims to investigate the genetic and environmental factors that contribute to autism and related physical and mental health conditions to better understand well-being in autistic people and their families. So there's a focus on autism, but also comorbidities. It's hoped 10,000 autistic people and, where possible, their families will take part. The study isn't looking for a cure for autism and does not aim to eradicate autism. Participants will complete an online questionnaire and provide a DNA saliva sample. Spectrum 10K researchers will study the information collected from the questionnaire and DNA saliva sample alongside their electronic health records. So that's the gist of Spectrum 10K from the horse's mouth, from their own website. Okay, so the, the initial pushback, the controversy when it was released to the world is very simple. So it's a, a DNA research study. They're asking for autistic people, and for the most part, parents of autistic kids to provide their autistic kids DNA for a research study into autism. The potential to use DNA sampling from the research study to come up with screening tests. It's a Pandora's box. In a moment, I'm gonna show you some of the key excerpts from my chat with Hunter Hansen where we talk about the key concerns of this study. But first, let's look at some of the main players and then you'll kind of get the gist of why there's some concern. Simon Baron Cohen, so not Ali G, Simon Baron Cohen is the director of Autism Research Center, the University of Cambridge. Now, Simon is the principal investigator of Spectrum 10K. His research interests and focus includes the mind blindness theory of autism, the fetal sex steroid theory of autism, autism prevalence and screening, autism genetics, autism neuroimaging, autism and technical ability, typical cognitive sex differences. Actually, is that a typo or is it typical cognitive sex differences? <laughs> I'll leave that up to you. And synesthesia. Next on the list, a distinguished professor of human genetics based at UCLA. Now, Daniel is the co-principal investigator of Spectrum 10K, and his laboratory has pioneered the application of systems biology methods in neurologic and psychiatric disease, fostering large-scale collaborative patient resources for genetic research and data sharing. Further down the line, head of human genetics. Matthew is a co-principal investigator of Spectrum 10K and leads a research group focused on deciphering the genetic causes of severe developmental disorders and understanding how DNA mutates and is passed from generation to generation. Well, there you go. Nothing to see here. Sounds fantastic to me. And with credentials like that, who could possibly have got the wrong idea that Spectrum 10K was going to get parents to hand over the DNA samples of their autistic children or autistic people hand over their DNA saliva samples and then be used for nothing more than just, well, in fact, is there even a benefit? Nothing more than just improving the lives of autistic people in ways that we don't really know. Then again, do we need DNA 
to improve the lives of autistic people? Hmm. No. <laughs> no, we don't. We just need better supports, a little bit of compassion, and well, a whole heap of understanding. Nevertheless, Spectrum 10K is taking the pause button off. The latest update on the website, it says that Spectrum 10K is in effect still in pause mode, but is undertaking some sort of consultation period. And then they will update the website with the results of that consultation period and in effect, plow on forward. So we're still on track for Spectrum 10K which has been paused for two years, hopefully the world's cooled down, to continue in 2023. What do you think about that? How do you feel about that? Well, maybe to raise the level of understanding on this particular topic and some of the key concerns from the autistic community on the Spectrum 10K DNA sample survey research thing, here's some, some key excerpts from a chat I did with Hunter Hansen on this very topic. There seems a contradiction. So they're looking at genetic and environmental factors contributing to autism, but they're not looking for like QR prevention or eradication. The intention of the study to me seems conflicted. What's your initial thoughts on on just purely the intention of the study? Because it talks about yeah. well-being. There are always going to be looming specters of things that just don't sit well with autistic people in the neurodivergent populace. When they mention, hey, we're going to study your DNA, but use that to extrapolate it into like environmental factors and the well-being of you and your family, I'm by trade, I'm more in the data business. I don't talk in specifics about that, but I do find that it is a rather specific biometric data collection aim for something that I don't really see a clear link to how, this might just be my lack of understanding, but I don't see a link to how it's going to inform other elements of my holistic well-being. Like, cool, you know my DNA, but why can't I just sample my environmental DNA to give you a perspective of, hey, here's my composition as a person. What you're aiming to answer requires a much more comprehensive sample of things that you can't test. It's not the immediate purpose. It's what it can be used for. And I think that's that's enough to give me pause personally. Like, oh, when somebody says, we only promise to use it for X, Y, and Z, you know, um, there's a lot of compromise that could potentially happen. There's, I'm not confident in the technology of many companies to, you know, protect something like that. While it's not necessarily a slippery slope to infer that there's more nefarious aims, the fact that you can see the landscape pitching downward to that gives me pause. The other thing I just wanted to quickly touch on and, uh, and ask you about with the kind of intention is, okay, they're basically saying, okay, so some autistic people have what they would class as bad comorbidities and some don't. And they're yeah. trying to say, we want, we're going to help you autistic people have better lives by working out why some autistic people have comorbidities of say epilepsy or anxiety or or yeah. whatever that may be, and why some of you don't. But then the question is, okay, dot, 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 but then what are you going to do to, to help that? So it, so yeah. it, it, there seems like there's a focus on, on comorbidities. And what are your thoughts on the idea that that's kind of, they're focusing on other things that affect yeah. your life and how that will, that will impact your well-being, but how? You know, I know people and children who are epileptic. They're not autistic, you know? So if it's like, if you're so interested in addressing those elements, you know, and I think you'd be hard pressed to say like, Hey, this is, this is not a variation. This is a debilitation. You mm -hmm. know, I would argue that autism is a, it's a neurotype. It's a variation. And yes, I understand it poses, you know, challenges in my life, but that is, that is my neurological wiring again, especially in what I think is just uh, ridiculous in like a self-selection study. You know, where it's people who are just who are diagnosed and opting into it, you have two levels of bias that ignores diagnosis. And I'm pretty, pretty picky about the self selection element. So, yeah. You already mentioned about the, I guess, the selective process. And we want to get to eugenics in a sec. But first, can I just get your take on just the basic idea of DNA collection, data groups, data collection uh, with regards to an autistic? study because i think maybe some people are ignorant in there they automatically just see it and hear it and go oh bad so from a broad perspective if you look at all of the furor that is generated over our understanding of our data like 
you know, you look at Facebook, they have gotten in trouble for mismanaging data. You look at TikTok and it's one of those that scrapes your data. You're an unwilling participant in so many data gathering objectives to where I think we've, we're getting to the point in society where we're finally realizing the value of, of who we are. We've enacted legislation, like at least in Europe with GDPR and other things to where like this is being taken seriously. And it's kind of too little too late, I think. Mm. But I feel like the more we get into it, the more we're realizing just how how data is being used in ways that most people don't understand. Just how algorithms are built, um, composites and profiles built to kind of frame who you are. And a lot of tech companies and other companies who harvest data, uh, just in general, or any company really, uses it to form a certain, they'll say, well, we don't know anything about you, but we can basically infer who you are, you know, and it's just, it pervades our life for purposes that we don't always consent to. So to take it to an almost fundamental genetic level, you know, that's quite the leap. And then from like the data standpoint, you know, I I get that different organizations are going to be limited to um, different populaces, right? So confining it to one region. And I think just the, the self-selection bit about, hey, we, we are only collecting information from um, not just autistic individuals, but those who would have had, or at least can infer some kind of diagnosis, which can mean different levels of quote unquote function, more appropriately support needs, access to diagnosis, you know? So you have somebody who may have been diagnosed, you know, as, as a child, others who don't have access to it. So I I then start to get concerns about like, you know, the data collection pool and how, you know, how much bias they are getting into it. You know what I mean? So it's not like we have a database of known cancer patients, which is basically agnostic in a lot of ways. There's just so much more rigor to it than even I can bring to it. And again, anytime you're, you're asking for volunteers, you are interjecting a little bit of bias into your methodology that that's generally how it works that's why sam- samples are conducted a little more randomly like you try to get like a certain control group and there's just so much more layers to conducting these kinds of larger statistical tests that maybe i'm conflating it to a little bit here but that's that's the first thing that gives me pause just from like a data collection and testing enterprise as well but I mean, as far as the ethics, the one, the one area to where I don't have the expertise is how these studies are conducted for other things. Like what if it is pancreatic cancer? How do you map that out? What if you're really trying to determine whether there is a uh, genetic or regional variant? And then the purpose of that is like, hey, we need to build a better treatment for it. Like that seems, that seems obvious. Cancer is a debilitating deviation from the norm. So I, but I don't know how those studies work. Like I, I don't know what they, and it's not like they're testing a drug or they didn't have to do this for like COVID patients. So it's more of understanding like deeper genetic makeup that, yeah, you could probably do that for some diseases, but autism's not a disease. I'd rather just build better support first because that will elevate more than just autistic people. And then if we're looking at specific comorbidities, like, oh my goodness, you know, my autistic son suffers from debilitating epilepsy or migraines that render him just non-functioning. It's like, well, cool. We need better drugs for migraines. Let's find the genetic link to epilepsy where there is just, it's not a variant neurotype. It is a, as a harmful, uh, debilitating condition. You know, there's not absolutely, there's not like you know, lower support needs with epilepsy. So, yeah. I was unlucky enough to study, do some bioethics units in uni. Um, Mm. Unlucky is the operative word. But I think what I would say is, okay, so, you know, kids under six, I mean, the kids are part, this is a predominantly, probably a lot of kids involved in this study. Does that mean that their parents are just making the decision for them? I mean, you know, can a kid under six or can a child of any age make informed consent? So what, you know, and Steve Jobs is a, is a grown man. You're a grown man. Yeah. There's a difference. So this is, you were, you were an autistic child once. Now, yeah, yeah. so was I, if our parents decided, okay, we're going to, we're going to be a part of this. We're going to take, we're going to let him, uh, we're going to collect his DNA for this study, but you're a child and, you know, down the track, you're an adult and 
the worst case scenario, the slippery slope and, you know, your DNA was part of what um, eradicated or, you know, provided a screening, a, a prenatal screening or whatever. I mean, yeah, it's a tricky situation with regards to um, child informed consent and parents making yeah. that call. And like, that's one to where I feel like that kind of, that, that pervades a lot more than just consent to testing. You know, like I'm just thinking of all the stuff that I have to do on behalf of my daughters. There is a scary undercurrent in this information age. And I kind of wonder if there is going to be a seismic shift to where like we really need to consider, you know, this is something that you, we do not want to look back and think our kids were unwittingly consented to something very serious when this is something that's so important. Like if you're too young to make a decision about something personal, then we need to just wait. You know what? Like in five years, some, some of that may have happened where it's like, Hey, you, you can't post pics of kids tagged as public because we have no way to validate their consent. That may be our, our future. I guess the eugenics and the future use this, this, these mm. are the hot button issues. Let's just yeah. talk about the idea that the core issue for autistic people is that no. DNA predominantly can be used to to cure something, to prevent something, or to screen for something. Uh, so potentially, yeah. there's the eugenic side of this study, and I think any autistic person would probably be pretty concerned that they there would be a future where their life could have could have been a question mark based on yeah. a screening test uh, or a prevention or a cure. Now we know clearly that you can't acquire or cure uh, autism. It's not a disease. It's a, you know, it's a yeah. neurological developmental uh, disability or how, whatever, you want, whatever you want to refer to it mm -hmm. as. What are your thoughts on the idea of a prenatal screening test for autism? I mean, <laughs> it's pretty intense a thought. It is. And I, when it comes to, you know, the, the potential eugenic consequences, I feel like that gets thrown out so quickly. Like, that's just one to where it's like, I'm just going to turn the dial all the way up on this. And then you bring in so many emotions that it tends to cloud a lot of the parts of the argument. I almost play like a mental double down because one of the very fiercest issues in America by either projection or politics or what have you is that of abortion, where it may be more black and white in other countries it's very much a hot button issue in America. So we think about eugenics, like we associate that with a different kind of historical context. But if I talk about choice, pro-choice, pro-life, and where this intersects, and then we get to an argument where it's like, what would you do with your child if you knew they were going to be born with Down syndrome? I can tell you what the numbers say. Well, there's a screening test. I mean, certainly there's in Australia, a screening, there's a test, for screening test. Yeah, exactly. And you know, based on you know laws and what would countries permit, uh, mothers are given the right to, you know, either continue their pregnancy or, or terminate it based on that information. But then I think I I still see people with Down syndrome who can advocate for their own quality of life. Yes, you know, and you kind of like if you zoom in and zoom out, there's just no. There's no easy way to reconcile that for a lot of people. You know what I mean? And then I think, what if we start substituting that for your daughter is going to be autistic? Think about people's understanding of autism now. This is the problem. Yeah, this is the problem. But then it's like, how do you reconcile that with as a mom? You know, they talk, I, I'm, again, I'm just using the phrase like, you know, a mom's right to choose versus a person's right to, to live. And that's like, there's no way of knowing there just yeah. isn't like, I don't know what my mom would have done. I mean, I can guess, but it's one of those where if you knew, hold on, you know, your son's autistic, he's going to be autistic, but Hey, let me show you what he's going to be like in 30 years. Like, Oh wait, that's autistic. <laughs> you know? exactly. Or, you know, so it, Orion, this is, this is one to where I, I have to tread very lightly. And I think the, the real damage that's done is people throw out the eugenics thing and they go all the way to like reach into I think more ominous historical context yeah. without breaking it down to where if this is used as a screening test, we would have concerns that there would be fewer autistic people, you know, that I'm, you know, maybe there's, I, I, I can be wrong on some of these things, but I would have to get a certain intersection of how you would balance 
autistic people who are advocating for just living full supported lives versus what mothers, parents choose to do with children who they know are going to be autistic, yeah. you know, and then I think, you know, maybe the fast forward element is listen, autism is not a death sentence just because your son is going to be autistic, just because your daughter has markers of autism. This is not something that is guaranteed to debilitate effect. Like, and that's one to where like, you've got to kind of match ignorance with education from a future um, use point of view. Okay. So spectrum 10 K clearly aren't doing this. We're not, I'm not suggesting spectrum 10 K are, are looking to do this, but, but with regards to DNA and data being unsold, being used for different purposes by other sources in the future, this is where it becomes a, a core concern. The future use, the on-selling of data and DNA for different purposes by different sources is, is, am, is that, am I drawing too long a bow or is that a, a realistic possibility in the future? I mean, I think there's, you know, I look at like the, the scaffolds of possible and, and probable and, I, again, my knowledge on medical data collection is limited, but there are, there are far fewer probabilities and likelihoods that do not preclude um, possibilities. You know, I, I'm going to come up with like a hypothetical that for all the data that we collect, in general, we have not optimized ways to use it best. That's why like things like data science and machine learning are continually evolving studies and people who can solve that quicker can do better with it. I think about like, you know, it's not so much what the stated purpose and like the ethical limitations are. Sometimes those things can change. Sometimes there's a creative way to where, oh, we happen to have this data set that we now have new tools to use it for. Yeah. And I don't know what those tools are. And then, you know, I think about other possibilities, like what's to speak of in terms of like security of that. So there's like a whole bunch of yeah. apocalyptic scenarios yeah. that I, again, I, I joke that I don't do so well with hypotheticals, you know, and I, I, I can stretch to think that there are many possibilities, but as with many things, the probabilities tend to be just a lot more boring. Yeah. You know, and this is bizarre coming from me because I'm not I'm not super optimistic about stuff, but I am optimistic that it's like, you know, you're going to get people who are going to be connected to autism in a way to where it's going to be about building greater understanding and support. I feel like there's been enough blowback and pushback about cures to where, yeah, they can try to work it in and then mask it, but even that is getting pushed back. At what point? And I think there will be a point you know, a lot of companies and initiatives will realize like, you know what, we can't even shape this approach in a way to where we have to claim that it's not meant as a cure. You know what I mean? So the fact that they have to put that disclaimer, I think the yeah. efforts in the future are going to be more, we're looking to make lives better for autistic people. Yeah. We don't want to know about your DNA. We just want to know what do you struggle with and how can we eradicate a lot of systemic obstacles like why can't they just say that hopefully this video has in some way helped you form a more sophisticated understanding of well not only spectrum 10k but research studies around autism in general i appreciate you watching this video if it's resonated please share it with your family and friends so we can reach more people until my next video thanks for your support and we'll talk soon